Hi, I'm Nicola Jennings, one of the co-founders of Athena Art Foundation. This is Athena Asks, a podcast where we talk to artists, curators, historians and collectors about their work, pre-modern art and the world today. Hello, my name is John Paul O'Reilly and I'm one of the presenters of Athena Asks. On the podcast today, our guest is the spectacular curator of paintings and drawings at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, Rosalind McKeever, also co-curator of the Fashioning Masculinities exhibition and the Art of Menswear. Rosalind, welcome. We're so thrilled to have you today and to hear more about the exhibition. It's a pleasure to be here. Should we start off just by talking about the the genesis of the exhibition? How did it come about? Where did the idea spring from? Was it the paintings that were the initial inspiration? Or was it some of these gowns and later fashions that you started seeing patterns with earlier periods? Well, the idea at its core was to do an exhibition about menswear in that the V&A has never done a major menswear exhibition before. Never? Never. We've had displays, we've always had a show in the fashion galleries of our menswear collections, and we've been collecting menswear since the v was formed. So it seemed bizarre that this had never happened before. But it was really a case of thinking about, well, A, it's never been done before at the v and B, we're experiencing this incredible kind of renaissance of the menswear industry, and this really exciting moment in fashion where ideas of gendered dress are really shifting. So it felt like a really exciting moment to look back and try and see how we got where we are, how the kind of norms and ideals that we see in 20th century menswear were created, how we got there, so that we can understand where these contemporary designers who are pushing against that are going, but also really taking an opportunity to think about how we could do an exhibition at the V&A that was coming from this interest in fashion, but was really expanding beyond the fashion collections themselves, looking across the museum, thinking about how we find fashion everywhere at the V&A, because wherever there's people, there are clothes and there is fashion. So in every department, and we have something from every department in the exhibition, except the glass section, we couldn't manage any glass, tragically. And it was a case of how we could bring those objects together, how we could bring together the fashion collections with painting, sculpture, photography, metalwork, prints, ceramics, to really take a deep dive into, as I say, how we got where we are. It's interesting looking sort of today at ideas of masculinity. Well, I suppose there's been a massive shift, hasn't there, in the last decade. But prior to this, I think there were ideas of what was manly that seemed to come really purely from the 20th century and the sort of late 19th century. And looking at men's fashion prior to that, you know, 17th, 18th century, They seem very feminine to the modern eye. And I think it's only more recently, as you say, that Couture has been exploring, playing about with gender roles a bit more. I think it's just the perfect moment to start tying what's going on in, in current fashion to past centuries, because it starts to make a little bit more sense. And some of these silhouettes, men in stockings, for example, or very decorative embroidered coats or the you know sort of very padded cloaks and capes they perhaps seemed much more foreign to a modern eye as an idea of sort of what the, a masculine form should be when you sort of first set about did you have a clear idea in mind of the sorts of loans that you wanted to secure and how much of it you wanted to anchor in the museum's own collections or did you sort of let it grow organically It grew really organically and it was a really interesting process because on one side with the V&A's collections, we were undertaking this really ambitious survey to go through all of our menswear holdings to see what we had and then working with every other department to see what they might have and what could work together while at the same time kind of ticking away in my brain the kind of, ooh, what what paintings could I borrow that's going to really bring that to life where are the where are the connections here and who are the contemporary designers that we should be thinking about who are 
either looking back to works in our collection or works in other collections where we can foster that feeling because we knew from the outset that there are chronological moments within the exhibition but we didn't want to make it a chronological survey our earliest objects are from about 1560 our most recent objects are from 2021 it's not a linear story of what happened there. We wanted to forever be bringing the contemporary up close, face to face with historical objects where that was going to be a really illuminating conversation. Visual similarities and then contextual differences that really open up our way of thinking about both of those objects. It's really clear in your book as well, which is fabulous, by the way. For people like us who are constantly trying to get people to look at old master paintings using any excuse we can, <laughs> there is a tendency, particularly if you've got a fashion exhibition like this, if you're not naturally inclined towards older art, you could be tempted to just sort of skip past it. And similarly, as you're reading through the book, I love the way that it's woven all the way through, which I think is really important because it really helps people to draw these parallels in their own minds rather than being told. You mentioned also that when you set up the exhibition that you played with the sight lines so that you're encouraging people to draw these parallels for themselves. Yeah. Can you tell us a bit about that and how you made those decisions? So there are some things where we paired objects and we put them right next to each other. It's crystal clear. So for example, we have a wonderful Sofonis by Anguissola portrait of Prince Alessandro Farnese in this beautiful sleeved case that he's very nonchalantly wearing over his shoulders and next to it we have this wonderful Dolce & Gabbana cape that feels so similar it's very much the younger relation of what Alessandro Farnese is wearing so we felt that those are the kind of moments where we have a clear visual relationship elsewhere we make people work a little bit harder to find things but as you say it's really about inviting these objects into conversation and by doing so, inviting the people who are interested in them into conversation. I should say briefly, the exhibition is in three parts, moving from the undress, looking at the body and underwear, to the overdress, where we're really looking at these kind of lavish silhouettes. And then redressed is the third gallery, where we're looking primarily at the suit. Two of my favourite kind of face-offs, where we have a reasonable distance, a mannequin facing a painting. But in the second gallery, we have this incredible portrait by Joshua Reynolds, who hated painting fashion. So I'm so pleased to have found this example of him really going to town on the details of clothes because he didn't like doing it. Of Charles Coote, who's in The Order of the Bath. And opposite him, we have... Harris Reed, this young designer who he describes himself as fighting for fluidity, really interested in concepts of gender. And so we've created this face-off of these two men in pink, one of whom was known as a terrible womanizer and just not a very nice guy, and opposite him, a young man who's showing a completely different way of being in the world in terms of gender. And that feels really exciting. The other one is in the third gallery. So in that section, it's really about tailoring. Everything is in black. And we have the wonderful portrait by John Singer Sargent of Graham Robertson in this beautiful long overcoat. And it's painted in the height of summer, <laughs> which is wrapped very tightly around him. So he's very, he's kind of very slim, very elongated. And Sargent has painted him as really youthful. And we have him opposite Timothy Chalamet, this kind of young heartthrob who is, is taking such a role in showing a different kind of menswear fashion on the red carpet. He's always making really interesting choices about what he wears. We saw that very recently with the Oscars, where there was such a furore about him not wearing a shirt. But the example we have is from the premiere of June, which is this exquisitely sequined suit that shimmers in this way that just feels so kind of sergeanty. I just want Sargent to paint this suit by Heder Ackerman because I just, there's such a synergy between these objects. So as I say, it's really exciting to have these moments where we're putting things together, but also these moments where we're making people work a bit harder.
it's the perfect way, really, isn't it, to, to help people to understand what fashion meant in earlier centuries. It's not like we're used to wearing couture all the time, or even really to seeing it, certainly not to feeling it. And I think when you go to an exhibition like this, you're able to understand in a way that you can't when you see these photographs that it's sort of ubiquitous of red carpets everywhere, a sense of the of the richness of the fabric, of the weight of it, of the, the sheer craftsmanship that goes into it, you know, not just the tailoring itself and the design, which of course is incredible, but also you know, all of the artisanal craft yeah. work that's involved. When you start to point that out to people and use that as a parallel for earlier fashion, fast fashion was was not really a thing and you had to carefully think about what you were going to be wearing and what message you were wanting to project through your clothes and a lot of that was about wealth and was about stature so i think you know being able to show these portraits next to couture is is important for that reason it really helps the viewer understand the sheer cost and effort that went into the outfits that these men are wearing for their portrait and why they chose to be depicted wearing these things. Well, what's really interesting is how important paintings are to our understanding of how these clothes should appear. So we're yeah. always giving our colleagues in textile conservation these portraits so that they can see how these clothes work on the body so that they can try and replicate that. They have such an important role in bringing these clothes to life and that's something that I think potentially in part was why paintings were always going to be a really important part of this exhibition and photography too, kind of visual media where we could show how the clothes are worn, we could show the attitude that yeah. goes into how people through portraiture were fashioning their identities in exactly the same way that you get with contemporary fashion photography, you get in the way that choices are made about what's worn on the red carpet, that those issues are the same. And then coming back to this question of the craft, the work that goes into these, we have the Anguissola portrait next to this D&G cape, but it's also very close by to a look worn by Billy Porter, designed by Randy Rahm, which was one of the Golden Globes, which is covered in this extraordinary beadwork. What we found really fascinating about installing that is that while the kind of paparazzi images of Billy Porter wearing that were all about this big cape that it had, that was, had this extraordinarily shocking pink lining, what draws your attention when you're looking at it is the embroidery that's down the back that barely got a look in. But what's fascinating is seeing that so close to Anguissola, seeing an artist who's so interested in embroidery, interested in textiles, going to such attention in her work to get us to understand the richness of those 16th century textiles. It's fascinating, isn't it? I've been reading um, quite a lot about Lavinia Fontana recently, a project I've been working on with Aoife Brady at the National Gallery in Dublin. But I think it's interesting, depending on the literature that you're reading and what period it was published in, because you know, there's a lot of talk with Fontana about how fantastic she was at depicting textiles and jewellery. And, um, and this is what made her, you know, this is what popularised her in Bologna and beyond you. She also went to Rome, completing papal commissions. The same is quite often said of Sofinisba, of her, you know, the intricacy with which she depicts these different textures. And it did occur to me, is there a slight, oh, she's a woman painting, so, oh, isn't it nice that she looks at the dresses? <laughs> I just there, def there definitely is that. And kind of coming back to what I was saying earlier about Joshua Reynolds yes. as being someone who was like, oh, I have no interest in fashion. We shouldn't be recording something as transitory as fashion. There's this derogatory sense, but I tend to think of it in a more kind of positive light of these female artists having this experience of undertaking the kind of activities that they were encouraged to as young ladies around working with textiles, as well as the, the kind of activities they weren't encouraged to do about making paintings, <laughs> that they physically know something. But then, yeah. so for example, Tintoretto, as an artist who grows up with fabric dyeing, that he's also someone that knows fabrics in a different way, that someone like Veronese has this 
experience with textiles that allows him to do something that uh, Andrea del Sarto, yeah, his exactly. father was a, a tailor, exactly. That there's this long running history there. They see the value in being able to paint those textiles. They know that their sitters for portraits want everyone to know. They want everyone to know 500 years later how beautifully they were dressed. So it's not, it's a kind of, it's, it's more about the experiences they're having rather than something innate. Exactly. And I think it's interesting to look at, you know, on the one hand, women, you know, were encouraged to be at home embroidering and that kind of thing. But when it came to the actual production of the clothes, tailors were almost exclusively men. Embroiderers tended to be men. Yeah, women would perhaps make the undergarments, which were somewhat more extensive in earlier <laughs> you know, earlier centuries than they were in later ones. But you know, sort of in the decoration of those, you know, they might be um, embroidering collars and cuffs and things mm. like that. Things like those sort of rich embroideries that you see in the Batoni portraits, those would be all executed by men. Yeah. And so I think that's something that we don't necessarily think about today. We tend to think about, oh, you know, women sitting at home sewing. Yeah. Yes, but they weren't doing it in a more sort of commercial Sense. Yeah, absolutely. And from the outset, this was always an exhibition about masculinity rather than about men. And so we wanted to think about who the artists and designers, sitters, wearers would be who were not men and who could show us something different. So we found it really interesting to choose female artists, thinking about people who are gender non-conforming and how the kind of long history of that as well in order to really kind of complicate our ideas and give a platform as well to contemporary female fashion designers as we thought that was a really important way to kind of pay tribute to the fact that we were able to include these historical works as well. I think it's really interesting that you underline that point that this is an exhibition about masculinity but not about men. That's a, a, an important distinction <laughs> to make. But now we're seeing this resurgence. Previously, an interest in fashion was seen as being sort of more effeminate and caring about what you were wearing um, or about your hair or, you know, moisturising. <laughs> seen as being quite effeminate. And yet, you know, in previous centuries, this absolutely was not the case. When you're looking at 17th century clothing, which is right up my street, the change between those really thickly padded garments that are, are so clearly mirroring the silhouettes of armour and seeing that shift um, towards those sort of 18th century boxy coats, particularly in England, where sort of at the beginning of the 1700s, they weren't necessarily so decorative. It was more about sort of browns and, and the country gentleman look, which in itself was an idea of masculinity. And then the impact that the Grand Tour had on these young men, you know, coming back from Italy, having seen the marbles and the casts of marbles that were so ubiquitous. And that's something that hadn't really occurred to me. And how you know, that affected the change in silhouettes, how waistcoats start to get much slimmer. And I think when I'd been looking at these 18th century portraits, I always saw them as having a bit of a paunch and these um, you know, sloping shoulders being sort of less of huh, masculine, um, you know, broad shoulder, narrow waist. Um, I, I'd seen that shift as sort of a softening of the body. I hadn't computed that in fact it was an attempt at making those slimmer lines and more muscular forms. Yeah. Well, that was one of the first things that we decided we wanted to do with the exhibition was really bring in the importance of those classical sculptures in giving us an idea of the masculine body as the kind of underpinning of all of what we're looking at in the exhibition, giving us an ideal that has been so resonant at different points in our history and in different ways that the Apollo Belvedere has so much to answer for in terms of a cornucopia of inspiration that people have taken for it, both about fashioning their own bodies, but also using tailoring as a way to perfect the body. But what we wanted to do was show how it's not just the Apollo Belvedere, who's kind of seen as the highest ideal of the masculine body and the highest ideal of art by Wunkelmann in the 18th century, but how you also have Antonus, who is kind of beautifully lithe and slim. You have the Farnese Hercules, who's just impossibly muscled in this way that 
feels so relevant now for the kind of pressures that young men are facing around their bodies and about gym culture. They're really looking at how the impact of seeing the Farnese Hercules, what that had on young men in the 18th century, that how these different ideals gave people different models to aspire to with a whole range of connotations. It's interesting that the Apollo Belvedere, as considered the kind of balanced centre between the extremes of the Antonis as being so slim, almost to the point of effeminacy, and the Hercules as being so ridiculously hulking, that the Apollo Belvedere became, in the 19th century, particularly the early 19th century, what tailors were trying to turn you into. In tailoring manuals, you see drawings of the Apollo Belvedere, and that's the body they're trying to dress. When they're correcting parts of your body through various pieces of padding, how they're cutting the suit, they're doing that to make you into him. <laughs> it's just fascinating. And I think that the same is the case today. I spoke with some of the senior tailors at Huntsman. One of them told me a story of a doctor who came in and he was a back specialist, I think. And he walked in and this tailor said, oh, you, you have a spinal curvature. And this doctor was you know, quite taken aback and didn't love the fact that this was being pointed out. And he said, well, how did you know? You know I, I hide it. And was, he said, well, I, I can see because I'm a tailor. I'm used to seeing a man's body, I can compensate with padding in different areas to even everything up. I can make your shoulders level. I can visually correct these areas. The modern wearer doesn't necessarily think about how much, even today, clothes are padded and sculpted. Even the most basic of jackets will have a, a shoulder pad. These things that we think of as being you know, sort of really over the top and strange and foreign in previous centuries are actually not that far yeah. away from what we're wearing today. Absolutely. I mean, one of the things I've found so fascinating in working on the show and speaking to contemporary designers is the amount of inspiration that they take from historical art that it's a kind of a source book for them. And that's why you get these repetitions, these these moments where someone who works on old masters is watching the catwalk is like, oh, I recognise this. These historical ways of presenting things are always returning to us in new, wholly unexpected ways. We talk about the fact that fashion is cyclical, but we probably think of that more in sort of 20 year cycles. And yeah, the 80s are back again, the 70s are back again. We don't necessarily think about, ah, oh, you know, the 1650s are back again. <laughs> but it's, it's true. true. You ha there, are, there are designers who are always taking inspiration. So if you look to the 1980s, you have new romantics are looking back to these historical ideas. You have people looking back to the incroyable in post-revolutionary France. You have people taking inspiration. And I think, we're, I think we're maybe more accustomed to thinking about it in women's wear, but it, it's always there in men's wear as well. We kind of wanted to push against this idea of menswear as something that would be static and unchanging. What I've found interesting as someone who's an art historian rather than a fashion historian is seeing how you can tell that a suit is from the 1980s. But it's often very subtle things, and I think that's what's so fascinating about what happens in the late 18th, early 19th century through to the mid 19th century around this construction of the idea of the suit is that all of those principles, all of that care about how you present yourself that you have in the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries that manifests itself in colours and patterns and silhouettes and all of these fripperies and decorations. People haven't fundamentally changed. All of that is still there, but it's in the lining, that it's in the subtlety of your cravat, that it's in all of these different ways that it comes through, that it feeds through. One of the things I think is really effective in the show is bringing together all of the black suits, because lining them up, you see precisely how different they all are. But if we'd have done the show in a chronological way, where they would have been interspersed with other things, you wouldn't have necessarily been able to appreciate that as closely. It's like how we look at paintings. You can pick up these really subtle differences if you're able to bring these objects together and really interrogate them.
That's it's so interesting that you draw that parallel as well, because as painting specialists, you're constantly being asked, well, how do you know it's by the person if it's not got a signature? And you're like, well, it's it's signed in every brushstroke. And I think it's the same looking at clothes. You just develop an eye, don't you? And to be able to date things and to be able to understand these just subtle cues in a lapel or in a pocket. I use historical fashion as a way to date paintings, particularly when it's periods that I'm not familiar with. You know? I'm an Italianist. I'm not so great on 18th century French, <laughs> but but because of studying historical fashion, I can look at a pocket and look at a lapel shape and look at a sleeve and I can you know, sort of place it chronologically that way. We tend to think about the history of fashion in terms of women's wear, certainly later on. And I think particularly skirt shapes as signposts that we use um, for dating. Can you tell us a bit about the, you know, the Siriano suit with the, you know, that large expansive skirt and how that fits in with our, you know, our ideas of masculinity, but also how that sort of playing with, with timelines mm -hmm. as well? Well, I think we wanted to include at the end of the show recent outfits that had really shifted the conversation about what men wear. That Siriano gown worn by Billy Porter to the Oscars felt like it was an essential for us in terms of someone taking the tuxedo as the kind of paradigm of privilege and power and access where you can go if you're wearing a tuxedo and where you can't go if you're not dressed appropriately taking that and making the most beautiful gown out of it. That felt certainly in the media like a breakthrough moment in terms of men wearing dresses, but in a really interesting way in that we've seen for certainly over the past at least 10 years, I'm trying to remember when David Beckham wore a sarong. I was, uh, just, I was just thinking David Beckham sarong. <laughs> but the kind of... I think that was more like 20 years. I know, it's terrifying, isn't it? We've seen so many of these moments, but I don't know, and I don't know if I'm being over-optimistic, but the past few years, the flavour has been different. The way that it's been reported, the way that people are reacting. And so it was really interesting to display this dress that is so big. When we were doing the dimensions of the rooms, we were worried about fitting it in. It was this high stress moment at the at the end of the install when this enormous gown appeared with all of these layers of tool underneath that my colleagues were kind of working through to try and get it on display. What's interesting about it is the silhouette of the skirt uh, to me is just sort of pure Disney princess. It's that epitome of youthful idea of feminine beauty. But there's something so stark because it's such good quality velvet. It is black as black as black, and it just absorbs the light, which means that as an object, especially when mounted on a mannequin, it just has such presence. I mean, I can't imagine what it was like when Billy Porter was in it. <laughs> I know, the kind of how much presence it has just on a mannequin. Earlier in the exhibition, we have this kind of lineup of tuxedos where we're looking at how, for example, Marlena Dietrich took that and turned it on its head then how Billy Porter is adding to that story with a tuxedo That's and a it, skirt. is that, that progression. What tends to jump to mind when you're looking at these large gowns you know, with, with really expansive skirts, today they only tend to show up on you, know, women's wedding days or on red carpets. What I think is interesting when you're, when you're thinking about historical fashion and about the women who were wearing these skirts, you know, they sort of served two purposes, didn't they? One of them was to display as much fabric as possible, to show as much of a pattern repeat as you could, because that shows that it's you know, woven on a larger loom and that how expensive of costly, sumptuous the fabric itself was, but it's also to take up space. And it was a way that women could take up space, either to present themselves as powerful, like maybe someone like Elizabeth I, or to keep people at bay and to say, you know, you can't come near enough for me to touch me because I am you know, so high on the social ladder. And I think that, you know, we see this constantly throughout the centuries, you know, through the Tudor period, for example, you see how women's fashion just mimics what's going on in men's fashion. You get the peas cod belly at the same time, you know, women's stomachers are becoming much more pointed and, and their you know, waistlines getting lower. And same with high heels. It was men who wore high heels first. 
So then to see sort of in the 20th century when you have quintessentially male garments like the tuxedo being worn by women and you know, totally usurped like Coco Chanel taking menswear and, and making it her own. To then see this flip of quintessentially feminine clothing being made masculine and taking up space when normally men don't need any help taking up space. <laughs> but perhaps if you're LGBTQ and there is a requirement to make a statement and perhaps to stand your ground, or really just to make it a huge statement on a red carpet where menswear has been so traditionally understated for the last century, I think is so interesting. And I love the fact that you finish on that point and you know, frankly make the, <laughs> you know, the, the visitors want to walk out in that very <laughs> garment even if they couldn't physically fit through the door in it. Um, I have a quick question about things like the Timothy Chalamet but also for Harry Styles. Did you have to wear white gloves while handling these things or, or could you touch them softly against your cheek while in the installation? <laughs> we handled them with the same professionalism as any garment that we handled during this exhibition. There was there was a free zone of excitement I have to say when <laughs> when we knew it was the moment that Timothy was coming out. My extreme joy the day that the Billy Porter tuxedo gown by Siriano came into the building, that was a highlight. And sort of going downstairs into the textile conservation studio, which is where my colleagues, the conservators, get these objects out, unpack them very carefully, and then mount them onto mannequins and make sure they're going to look exquisite. That's a really nice moment to end on. <laughs>